This is the second part of a two-part series on the law, special education, including the history of special education, specific to the law. If you've not listened to the first, I'd ask you to stop this, go back to the first, and then return back after you've listened to the first part. If we recall from our previous conversation, kind of timeline-wise, as legislation and litigation was developing, we'd gone through the 50s and saw from the 14th Amendment pr process and due process that litigation took place in Brown versus Board of Education. From that, we had this idea of desegregation, but as we saw like in 1957 in Little Arc, Arkansas, that was forced, what, nine students forced by the National Guard of totaling over a thousand individuals, thousand soldiers. So clearly just saying, okay, court, it's the law of the land, separate is not equal, did not necessarily turn into separate is not equal, but rather had to be required and required by force. By the 1960s, we have Martin Luther King Jr., of course, and he just didn't arrive in the 1960s, but we have this idea that civil rights. And in 1964, we have the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Now that deals not with education so much as it deals with gender, race, color, creed, but it's that next step in the fact that of this fight for equality. And of course, as you know, and I'll just re review with you, this civil rights legislation focused on uh, buses, bathrooms, restaurants, theaters, uh, public buildings, and it goes on and on and on in terms of uh, what used to be separate seating. Water fountains for colored individuals, not being able to sit at certain types of parts of the restaurant, having to enter the restaurant from the back or the rear. Those things were being addressed. Or the Jim Crow laws, as they were commonly referred to during the, uh, most of the 20th century up until the 1960s. Now that also led to a very critical time period, and the image is a bit blurry, but Lyndon B. Johnson, president that followed John F. Kennedy, and this is his elementary school teacher out in front of a classroom, a building of his when he was out there near Austin, Texas. But it also led to the passage of No Child Left Behind. And you may be saying, well, Sean, wait a minute, No Child Left Behind, that was passed in 2001 under President Bush. Well, that's correct, but the initial or the version of No Child Left Behind passed in uh, the uh, early 2000s was actually from the Elementary and Secondary uh, Education Act. And that is what it's still called. It's called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It's referred to as NCLB. That was passed in 1965 initially under the Lyndon B. Johnson's administration. And the focus of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was the federal support for uh, classroom-based, elementary, middle, and secondary classroom-based things. Now, of course, the most recent version, as we know, has a lot to do with standards, has a lot to do with testing. Uh, everything that No Child Left Behind is part of is an extension of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. I mention that because there we are in the mid-60s talking about, okay, we need from a federal standpoint to enhance equality, enhance funding of public education so that we don't have really poor schools in Mississippi and really rich schools outside of Cleveland, Ohio. But instead, there's an equality regardless of where you grow up. And that's certainly backed on our Constitution and the like. Now, that extends to what about disabilities? And see, part of that what about disabilities has to do with what was happening with individuals with disabilities during the 1950s and 1960s. Now, during the 1950s and 1960s, and prior to that, we had a lot of individuals that weren't not in their homes. These individuals I picture here, uh, clearly they very well may not have lived back then. We didn't have the technology, or if they were living, they certainly weren't living at home. It was a whole different philosophy. Now, this kind of offers a visual of that philosophy. I'm going to play it. I'll give you a link to it as well directly. Uh, but it has to do with Geraldo Rivera. And uh, actually, I'll give the link. I'll let you play it at your leisure. But the focus here is the fact that many of these individuals were institutionalized. And the institutionalization of individuals with disabilities led to outcomes that were very, very different. Now, the point being here is you may not know Chris Burke, but Chris Burke was an actor during the 1990s. still is an actor, but he was on uh, network television in the 1990s, Cor Corky, the, the show was Life Goes On. Um, brought a lot of presence to individual with disabilities, specifically Down syndrome, uh, starring in that show. There he is with my son and my daughter. Uh, he was in Topeka, uh, Kansas, um, oh, a couple years back. But the purpose of bringing up Chris Burke is that Chris Burke was known in terms of uh, a national uh, presence, a bit of a celebrity. 
there in the 1990s. But when he was born in the 1960s, the first thing that was asked by his parents, and he was the youngest of seven, and this is in New York City, so fairly progressive area. It's not rural Kansas or rural Ohio or anything like that. The medical doctor said, well, he has a disability, so send him to an institution. The institution very well could have been Willowbrook, and I do want you to watch that YouTube click when you get a chance. But the idea is that send him to an institution, and that's where he's going to be served. And by the way, the life expectancy for Chris Burke when he was born in the mid-60s, I think it was 1965, was about 30. His learning, his ability to read and all that was very, very limited in terms of life expectancy and what was expected of an adult with Down syndrome. Um, his self-help skills, his ability to uh, maintain and, and support himself were very limited, again, based on the fact that he was in, in an institution. Now, of course, Chris Burke uh, grew up in his own family, but the point being is in the 1960s, the institutional movement was where these individuals were told to go. And, oh, by the way, families were told, don't go and visit them because th that will jeopardize the program in place at the institution, it will confuse them. So many families simply sent their baby to these institutions and they may very well never see them again, or very rarely. Or you'll have siblings that never knew they existed, their parents would. A lot of guilt there, a lot of, you know, but at the same time the medical model was go ahead and do that, that's the appropriate thing, the most humane thing. Now Chris Burke did not do that and many parents, of, like Chris Burke's parents, decided during the 60s, no, I'm going to take my child home. That's where the rest of my children are. And that led to, for example, today, the life expectancy of an individual like Chris Burke with Down syndrome, life expectancy is well into his 60s. So it's double the lifespan by taking them out of the institution and so many things more. But the point being is if they're at home now during the 60s and into the early 70s, parents are now going to be asking, well, wait a minute, uh, my child's five, six, school age, I'm going to send him to my local school. And what they quickly found out was, well, no, we don't service kids with Down syndrome. We don't service kids with in wheelchairs with intellectual disabilities. We don't service kids with cerebral palsy. Sorry, um, never done it, not going to do it. Well, by the early 70s, these parents are now sending their children to school, and it led to litigation. Just like Brown versus Board of Education nearly 20 years ago or two decades before, the same type of litigation is coming up and saying, well, wait a minute here, in states of Pennsylvania and D.C. and other eastern seaboard states, the focus was, you're refusing to serve my child. Uh, you're not doing it in a manner similar if you are accepting it. And most importantly, you're saying that, well, that's fine because, you know, we can separate these individuals. And the same purpose, the same idea under Brown versus Board of Education, the courts decide the same way. You have to provide the least restrictive environment. It has to be a free, appropriate public education. And these were outcomes of the litigation, particularly the Mills versus Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania versus, or Park, as it's referred to, versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, that then led to early 70s, just like the uh, ESEA. Well, you have, the, you have the court cases that impacting legislation that impacts what the White House passes. And, of course, if you get a chance, go ahead and take a look at your, I'm just a bill, I'm only a bill. I live on top of Capitol Hill, of course, yeah. I hear you guys singing right now. But the idea here is that it passed the, the legislative process. The litigation led to the legislation, and that led to 1975 the passage of No Child, excuse me, the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act and later being referred to as Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That led to this idea of an individual education program or plan, IEP. That led to this idea that children with disabilities are allowed for and, and required to receive a least restrictive environment and a free appropriate public education. That led to the fact that you cannot reject a child based on his disability. That led to non-discriminatory evaluation to determine whether or not that child's appropriate in the program that they're being provided. So that led to the 70s. So if you think of it sequentially, the 50s in terms of litigation for those who are black, the 60s confirms that as well as female and, and other co components. And then at the same time, this movement to deinstitutionalize individuals with disabilities, they're now at home. Or they're not going to the de they're going they're not going to the institution. They're staying at home. Well, of course, then I want them in school. And with that, the key components of the six principles of IDA, as I mentioned, are the following. And this is out of a resource I'd be happy to share with you. But the six principles are zero reject, non-discriminatory evaluation, what's an appropriate education, least restrictive environment, procedural due process, and parent participation. Those are the six key principles.
So for example, I have a young man who has no brain, literally, born without a brain. He has a brain stem. His brain stem allows him to basically stay alive uh, through his breathing and with supports. But the individual really doesn't have the capacity to learn uh, the way we define learning. So does that individual, and they're ambulatory, and they're basically just hooked up to a feeding tube. Is that individual um, allowed for, or do we need to educate that individual? Um, some would say, well, there's no possibility of learning, so why would we say that the individual could be educated? So no, of course, that child needs to go to a different type of setting, a nursing home or, or something else. Well, no, IDA says zero reject, so if the child's school age, that child's going to receive services. Now, what those services look like would depend upon those needs. So zero reject means zero reject. And another instance might be the fact that, well, the child comes in has a feeding tube. And also, I need to not only feed, but I also need to make sure that I change their diaper. Well, we can't simply say, well, let's see, we're going to train one person, and that one person will be the person that does this. And if that person's not in school, like a nurse, then that child can't be there. No, 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 no. First of all, it's not required to be a nurse or a medical doctor. We very well would be trained to clean the tube, to clean the individual, um, and do it in an appropriate manner. There would be multiple people trained to do that, so if any of us are sick, uh, someone else is there, so our attendance, if we have a disability, is not dependent upon whether or not an adult is there. Um, so that's another example of, no, zero reject. It's, it is. It's just, regardless of the disability, you cannot reject the individual. Non-discriminatory evaluation is really critical, especially in this day and age of English language learners. Um, the fact that we cannot provide an evaluation that's not in an individual's native language. Otherwise, we end up identifying them with a disability, and it has nothing to do with the disability. It has to do with the fact that we tested them, uh, they're Spanish speaking, and we tested them with an English language test. Appropriate education is appropriate for the individual, and that's very critical. We'll talk more about that as the semester goes on. Least restrictive environment, again, that's a continuum. And the continuum might be the general education classroom, but a least restrictive environment may be a residential placement where the individual sleeps there, they're 24-7 there, they receive an education, but it's highly restrictive based on their needs that maybe they're suicidal or their behavioral needs are so bad that they need direct intervention with uh, individual counseling, group counseling, uh, a behavioral management program, and they need it 24-7, something that they are very concerned about if they did not receive in the evenings or on the weekends. That could be, that's the other end of the continuum, so it could be anything in between from a general education environment to a 24-7 very restrictive environment. Depending upon the individual's needs, depends upon whether or not it's the least restrictive environment. Procedural, procedural due process, we'll talk more about that, but it's that right to be able to say, from the parent's perspective especially, um, you have not followed the, uh, the law and therefore I have an opportunity to seek, you know, uh, not necessarily, not monetary reward, but rather seek appropriate education and do that, and through that I do due process. And finally, parent participation. I can't emphasize this enough. The initial passage of IDA, uh, PL 94-142, had parents referenced in it over a hundred times. And that's because in order to advocate for that individual, it needed to be parents. The individual couldn't advocate for themselves. Now, PL 94142, I want you to understand, since 1975, it's been reauthorized several times, and with it, there's been modifications. First of all, the language itself has changed, but also what we fund has changed. So, for example, um, in 1990, we included two other disability groups. We defined autism for the first time, and we also defined traumatic brain injury for school services for the first time. We also decided ADHD would not be a category, and it's not a category. We also decided transition services were critical because many of the individuals that started the program in 1975, 76, 77, we were realizing that as um, high schoolers and going on into post-secondary outcomes, college or work, they weren't being nearly as successful as their typically developing peers. So we need to be more um, uh, focused on that. In 1997, uh, we needed to be included in all state assessments. And we also need to address significant behavior. So there's some modifications there we'll talk about this semester. And then finally, in 2004, the most recent um, reauthorization, we talk about progress monitoring, but also the integration of evidence-based practice. Many of us know this as MTSS, 
here in the state of Kansas, multi-tiered systems of support, or this idea of response to intervention, this tier-based intervention that some of you may be more comfortable with nationally, even though MTSS is being referring to nationally as well. But I want you to understand, as I've said before, the law is living. It continues to evolve, and this is an example where it will be reauthorized again shortly after No Child Left Behind, which is set to be reauthorized if uh, it won't be in 2012, but most likely 2013. And most likely then IDA would be reauthorized shortly after that, probably 2014. Now, it has four parts, and the primary part of IDA is Part B. But Part C, for example, deals with um, birth to three. And yes, if I have a disability and I'm two years old, I do receive services. But I don't receive services in school. Most instances, like the state of Kansas, I'm going to receive services at home, or maybe in my daycare center, or maybe in my preschool where I go to school. But what we're going to focus in on ages 3 to 21. So if I'm at the age of 3 and I have a disability that's been identified under IDEA, a school district is required to provide me services that are free to me in appropriate and least restrictive environment. And so that's a critical element of Part B. Now, of course, I get to school age. When we think of school age kindergarten, I continue with an IEP and I very well will go into a, the local elementary school. A number of individual disabilities will graduate with their peers, but there's a segment of the population that to graduate at 18 or 19 is inappropriate. They still need more supports. It may not be academic focused, it may be more adaptive life skill focused. And those individuals can be serviced up until and through the age of 21. So for example, school year starts, it's October, I'm 21, I turn 22, I have those services for the remainder of the academic year. So until May, even though I'm 22 most of the year, I was 21 when the services started September 1st, and therefore, or August 15th or whatever, and therefore I get those services until uh, that the end of that year. So I very well may be 22 when those services end. And that's again for a specific number of individuals and we'll talk about that. Now, part eight terms to remember. We've already mentioned free appropriate public education. Uh, it also involves homeless children, uh, those that have limited English proficiency. Now related services as well, please understand related services, speech, um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, art therapy, music therapy. Now, it continues to grow. It does continue to grow. And parts of, uh, parts of IDA Part A that uh, continue to grow with reauthorization is one, we are concerned about the low expectations for students with disabilities, and we are not focusing on what we knew worked. So, to solve that, IDA 2004 focused on high expectations, access to general education curriculum, we need to make sure the parent is further empowered. We need to make sure that the IDA and NCLB interconnect well, and they do. We need to provide what's appropriate. We've already talked about that. We need to make sure that professionals working with our children are highly qualified. And many of you have heard that term because that goes across No Child Left Behind as well. And we need to make sure that we're integrating evidence-based practices. Now, to support that, one of the outcomes of 2004 also is their, the paperwork that's required in special education, they're trying to reduce that. Paperwork is important. It shows a trail, it documents what's necessary, but at the same time, we don't want it to be the focus. And finally, with the growth of technology, how else to further integrate technology and use as support? Okay, now this is an example of the fact that, you know, the fair for, you know, what's fair. And of course, we're going to use the same exam for everyone. Well, climbing a tree, that monkey's going to do quite well. I don't know if anyone else is going to be in the birds, the birds going to fly. I'm not sure if that technically is going to be considered climbing. But the idea that we need to make sure that it's appropriate for the individual. So if we're going to do standardized testing, what's appropriate for the individual? Uh, and that's kind of representative of that. Now, purpose of IDA is FAPE, unique needs. We have rights protected. We also assist the local and, and state educational agencies, school districts, and also what the state does and we need to make sure that it's effective, okay? No Child Left Behind, very similar, deals with accountability, highly qualified teachers, there you go, evidence-based research or scientifically based. We wanna make sure the schools are safe, we wanna make sure principals are engaged, and we wanna make sure the local educational agency or LEA has flexibility. 
And if you take a look at the major principles, there we are, individual and appropriate, least restrictive, procedural due process, and parent participation are overlapping with the principles of NCLB. So NCLB doesn't focus so much on discrimination for evaluation, nor do they focus on zero reject. Um, those are elements that are kind of unique with IDEA.